Hi everybody, it's the Stratosphere Lounge, brought to you through the miracle of uh, post-production. Uh, as usual, all the uh, levels are perfect, um, sound has been thoroughly checked out, uh, the picture's intact, the studio's nice and dry, uh, no water leaking or anything like that. Um, we are, as always, spend several hours just preparing everything here uh, to get uh, to get all the, all the meters exactly right where they want to be. Uh, I just want you guys to know that uh, that's how much we care. Um, you know, probably an hour or so, maybe two, of uh, of time. You know, just basically coming in, just going through the, um, you know, the basics, making sure that all everything's all switched correctly, and that we've got the right um, you know music cues up, and that all of our other stuff is working correctly, because uh, that's you know that's the kind of quality that that this show is known for. Um, in any event, welcome to uh, Stratosphere Lounge episode 120, and uh, I just wanted to say that um, things have been really pretty humming around here. Um, we did, in fact, get a, a significant number of members, a large number of members from uh, PJTV came over, and that means that this is actually, for the first time ever, really kind of a business. It was always sort of, a, I want to say maybe a boutique or a studio. It's actually a business now. Will Carla make her Hitchcockian cameo again? I think she might. She's in every Stratosphere Lounge. You know, she was in the original 120 of them. She's always somewhere in the background. Maybe she's one of the pictures or hiding in the back or, or you know, she's always in every one of them. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's actually starting to feel like a business. The best part of it is, needless to say, that, um, that I get to uh, hire my friends uh, Steve and Scott because of, because of your generosity. And that's a nice feeling. Um, we've done six weeks of uh, right angle now, and we haven't um, haven't missed a day. I uh, haven't missed an episode. That's that's nice for a little outfit like this. The outfit at PJTV was, as you probably know by now, you know, two graphics people, sound person, director, camera people, a couple of producers, you know, stage manager. Now it's the three of us and Carla, and it's going along really well. So we're really really proud of the right angle shows, and I do have some interesting news. Uh, and that news is that we are going to be debuting a new show here at uh, BillWhittle.com based on the fact that so many um, so many uh, people did come over. It's not like we're wallowing in money, but we are extremely grateful. And one of the things we wanted to do was to produce uh, a new show with my friend Scott Ott. So here's what we were talking about doing. Um, we have a lot of requests for people who just want some news stuff and it's hard for me to stay on the news cycle only because my um, post-production tale is as long as it is I got so much editing to do and so on and as many of you know back at the old uh, back at the old network uh, Scott did a couple different shows he did uh, Scott uh, Thought which was commentary kinda like uh, uh, Afterburner and Firewall not as spectacular obviously but I mean nevertheless uh, it was that and then um, he also did uh, the uh, PJTV news break, and so when we realized that we had um, we had enough uh, scratch to keep to keep us in you know pundit chow, uh, we sat down with Scott and I said, "Listen, is there any chance that we could make our members happy by giving them a news show that was a combination of of both um, PJTV news break and the Scott I thought?" In other words, Scotty. Is there a way that you could do um, once a week a show that looked at the top three or four stories of the week and then basically you, you tell us what happens then you put your spin on it and you and you give us you know the the the, the uh, Scotty uh, option on all these things and he said yeah so um, I've got a uh, a pilot here now the background is about right the you're gonna see some foreground elements that are that Scott just threw together uh, I also want to stress that this is his first test ever with the uh, with the cameras that we sent him. So blue screen lighting, makeup. This is a this is essentially a um, uh, a camera test. But the reason I like it is because the second Scott sent me this, I just I just started screaming. I said, "That's exactly what we want! Exactly, it's exactly right. It's exactly the tone." So um, you know, uh, we have tested this uh, clip out probably 30 or 40 times before we went on the air today. So I'm sure everything will run just exactly normally. Uh, but if they don't, um, then give me a second. And uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Scott's title 
is perfect. And since it's going to show up in a second, I would uh, I would tell you what the title is. Uh, Scott has decided to call this show news, actually, and that's exactly precisely what I was looking for. Something something a little whimsical, something a little different, and. Um, and uh, this show will be for members, and we'll do, p- probably do a cut down that we'll put out for the public. But this essentially is to thank all the people that came over. And uh, without further ado, uh, here is a little bit of news, actually, with my friends, Scotty Ott, and let's roll it. This is news. Actually, I'm Scott Ott. The Secret Service on Friday shot a man who allegedly brandished a gun near the White House. The suspect, taken into custody and treated at a nearby hospital, said he can't understand why the Secret Service shot him because even though he had a gun, he wasn't a threat to the president since he was nowhere near a golf course. President Obama said that a U.S. drone strike killed the leader of the Afghan Taliban, Mullah Akhtar Mohammed Mansour. Excuse me. With their leader gone, Obama called on the Taliban to, quote, seize the opportunity, joining the Afghan government in a reconciliation process that leads to everlasting peace and stability. I'm sorry, did I say everlasting? I meant lasting peace and stability. A Taliban spokesman reportedly said, hmm, Obama is right. We were mistaken about the Quran. Muhammad wanted only lasting peace and stability. Where do we sign up? With Mullah Mansour dead, the Taliban will now seek a replacement that has all of Mansour's strengths with none of his weaknesses. Taliban officials are said to be surfing LinkedIn for a devoted Muslim with jihad industry experience, a preference given to candidates under four feet tall, capable of rapid evasive maneuvers, and with no detectable heat signature. An ABC News Washington Post poll shows Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in a dead heat for the White House. The poll also shows that four in 10 Republicans don't think that Trump's views reflect the core values of the party. Now, Trump said that pollsters probably didn't explain to voters in the survey what his core Republican views are. Winning, beating Hillary, and also other things. That I can tell you. Bernie Sanders vows to fight for the Democratic nomination to the bitter end. He said DNC Chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz has stacked the deck in favor of Hillary Clinton. Go figure. Sanders said if he's elected president, he will not reappoint Schultz to her DNC leadership post. A spokesman for Schultz said, And people wonder why we have superdelegates. Hmm. In an effort to mollify angry Sanders supporters, the DNC allowed the Vermont senator to pick five members of the DNC platform committee, with Hillary Clinton choosing six and Wasserman Schultz picking the remaining four. Now, you might think that Sanders is still outnumbered two to one, but that just means that you didn't learn math through Common Core now, did you? The non-binding Democratic platform is crafted to let voters know what the party would stand for if it were not nominating Hillary Clinton. This is news. Actually, I'm Scott Ott. This is news. I just love that boy. I do. I just love him. Um, the The writing on the first pilot was even funnier. And uh, needless to say, uh, what we've got here is just a we slapped a graphic background on. We just did the first of the uh, uh, chroma key tests and so on. We've got a really nice news package that features the element behind us, the rotating Earth. We're going to slow down quite a bit, and then um, all the elements look like an actual news show. And uh, and Scott's going to be. Uh, you know, going to be pounding that out and uh, pretty much doing it at home and doing his own production value on it. And that's what means it can actually, uh, you know, get out the door. So our plan is, uh, you know, we, we've we been doing so much uh, for free here for so long. Somebody, I was up at Cal Poly, and I had done a rough thumbnail estimate of the just a real super rough guess of how many um, total uh, views I'd had in the time I've been up, you know, over course of hundreds, probably thou- certainly thousands of videos. And um, and I was trying to figure out what that number was, and I thought it was around 30 to 40 million. But a guy at Cal Poly, one of the students, spent a little more time on that than I did. And he says it's closer to 100 million total views everywhere over everything. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Um, we don't have that many members. Uh, we've got considerably fewer than that. And the reason I bring up the total numbers and the, and the amount of work is uh, we've been giving out an awful lot of uh, free ice cream, and we're going to continue to give out the free ice cream 
but the free ice cream which used to be paid for by other people's checks is now being paid for by the audience and uh, so uh, news actually is going to be members only content however um, I think what we'll probably do is edit down at least one of those beats if not two of them and release them at the end of the week for the public so they can at least get a taste of it and see what they're missing. Um, but uh, I just couldn't be happier with it, and uh, Scott's style is terrific. He's just such a terrific guy to work with. He's so, um, you know, he's just, he's just, he's it. He's the guy. He, his, um, his uh, you know, the, 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 the four we shot, the right angles we shot yesterday are just terrific. And um, we're going to get that graphics package, you know, buffed up a little bit. We'll get the image quality a little bit better. And needless to say, we'll bring in pictures where it just kept saying news actually the whole time. So with that said, I think uh, I think it's going to be great. And um, and it's uh, nice to be able to pay back uh, uh, both the new people that came over. I'm going to pay them back, you know, give, give them something uh, exciting. And especially nice to... Um, to provide it for the people that have been, you know, slugging it out with me here since the beginning, almost uh, two and a half years ago. So, yeah, it's um, it's starting to look like a, a business here. We, Steve and Scott are back. We're going to try and see about doing Hair of the Dog or bring back something else that uh, that Steve did. Uh, a couple people have asked about Clavin. Um, Clavin is uh, a possibility. He's uh, working just down the street with um, Jeremy Boring and Ben Shapiro doing the Daily Wire stuff. And I talked to Jeremy about it, and I said, is there a world where... If I don't have to pay for Clavin, you don't have to pay for me. He's Clavin's in there pretty much almost every day. I'll come over one day a month, like we did back at the old place, and do or one every two weeks, and do eight episodes and you know eight eight segments. We've gotten really good at it. And he said he wants to think about it. So there's a chance even that we can bring back to the um, uh, the fold the Clavin Whittle show. Although even that will probably be under a new name. It's always good to start new names because number one, it's kind of a new branding, and secondly, you get out of you know any potential legal troubles. So. Uh, so the Clavin thing could come back as well. And, uh, you know, all of this is based on memberships, it's based on the people that did actually move, and certainly if you want to bring some more of this over, uh, we'd love to have you. Um, but you're not going to get a big commercial from me tonight because we've done, uh, we did what we had to do. We really just did what we had to do, and I, I was not sure what we would, but we did, so happy days. Um, we can always use new members. Uh, so let's get on to uh, uh, Stress for Lounge 120 because the, one of the things about, you know, Right Angle's four shows, a, uh, four, it's five. It's five shows a week. It's a Bill show, a Steve show, a Scott show, a members only show plus the backstage show, which is, um, you know, our conference call, which I'm really glad to be showing because I always thought those conference calls were really fun. But that's five new pieces of video that have to be edited every week. Uh, we've got some, uh, some uh, junior birdmen coming in here and they're, you know, literally, 15-year-old uh, is cutting some of this stuff, and um, and we're going to start moving him uh, up. He's already doing most of the right angles. We'll get him into some of the other stuff like Nexus Report and Time Over Target. Give me a little more room. But I'm still scrambling to get things like the, the next firewall out, which is called uh, Bernie's Free College Isn't Free. Uh, I had jury duty last week, and that knocked that just knocked a week right out of me. Um, I mean, it was just really, really tough, uh, schedule-wise. I uh, went in for two days to find out that they didn't need me, but... Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, we're we're about set to go. So we'll do a fairly we'll do a fairly short one tonight. But uh, I, I get the feeling that the weather's starting to clear as we bring in more and more people. Um, uh, you know, as we're able to afford more and more editors, that means that the more members we get in, the more people we can hire to do kind of the bottom level stuff, and that frees me up to do more of the top level stuff, uh, like um, you know, making sure that the uh, telephones have been adequately sanitized and uh, and uh, you know just keeping keeping the place vacuumed. Um, it's uh, it's actually really exciting. Um, by the way, uh, I was out at San Luis Obispo talking to somebody about some videos that we're probably going to be shooting for uh, for younger people. Uh, haven't figured out what we're going to do there yet, but I think I might um, I might do the common sense resistance thing that we originally had in mind before I started thinking about it as a feature film. We could do uh, these. We've got a contract to do uh, a certain number of videos, at least six for millennials. We're working with Turning Point USA and Charlie Kirk, who's going to, we're all going to be working for Charlie Kirk someday. And um, we are we are um, basically trying to figure out how we're going to skin this thing. I've got a pretty good idea what we're going to write about, but I don't think that me in front of a green screen is exactly the way to do it. So um, I think what we're going to do is go to that idea that I've been hanging on to for a while, and we'll probably just call this the common sense resistance, and I'll probably shoot the first one. 
underneath, you know, on a pile of rubble someplace with them. And the only light will be the light coming off of the, you know, the iPad or whatever. And then we'll shoot them in sewer pipes and we'll shoot them in drainage ditches and we'll shoot them out back everything. And, you know, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll just get kids to do some of them and we'll split up the delivery duties. And I think it could be pretty cool. It'd certainly be a little more, um, a little more rad and a little more, uh, visually interesting and dramatic, uh, and much shorter. I gotta keep these things under three. That's very hard for me. I'm try really should try to keep them under two, but we're excited about that. So anyway, I was talking to somebody over at um, Cal Poly about that, who uh, I think is going to be a big part of helping us out in the future. And I was coming back, and I just got delayed. I started yapping and flapping my jaws, and I wanted to get out of there by around sunset because it takes about 45 minutes for the sun to go down. And in the long easy, it's about um, about a 45 minute flight. As a matter of fact, I'm going to cheat and pull up a picture. I didn't know if I was going to go into this, but I'm going to, uh, I'm sure some of you saw it or most of you saw it, uh, on a Facebook page, but in any event, so there I was surrounded by Bengal tigers and, uh, and I ended up getting out of there later than I wanted to say the least. So, um, I, I got to the airplane at, at least half an hour after I wanted to be there. And then uh, I thought I was just going to get the fuel and just cruise on out of here. But that's not what happened. And you're going to have to excuse me while I try and get this little picture up because it's a really cool little picture. And as a matter of fact, what actually happened was uh, things were quite delayed waiting for the fuel truck. The fuel took almost almost 45 minutes, not, not, not that long, half an hour maybe half an hour to get there. Where's that darn picture? I just dragged it onto the desktop. What kind of a, this is just straight up communism. So what it is, I'll do it again. Fine. I'll do it again. Um, and so I ended up leaving, uh, San Luis Obispo, uh, at least 45 minutes later than I wanted to. Um, and that's an interesting little story because, uh, getting back to Los Angeles from San Luis Obispo is, is not a super long, um, flight or anything. It's only about 40 minutes, but uh, it's 40 minutes direct. And by the time I got out of there, ah, uh, there we go. Now I can finally tell this story in peace. Just give me one second. I'll just drag this in here, set it up, and you get an idea what, what the heck I'm going to all this trouble for. That's you, and you need to get the right audio, and then I think we'll be good to go. Good. So, uh, yeah, so I put a new engine monitor in the airplane, and the old engine monitor was an LED, uh, LCD display, and you'd look down at it, and it would basically say, you'd be a little tiny little indication, it'd be like, it'd be like um, OT, and then a, then a black, you know, number, 193, and you'd, you'd have to literally walk yourself through it. I think OT, OT is oil temperature. And then 193 is probably pretty good, actually. Not too bad. It should be less than one. How much? 220, 230. So I've been looking at this thing down here with all these just number displays, and they're very, very uh, poor compared to analog displays because analog displays show you relationship distances. You can just glance at it and get the idea. And um, so anyway, I got a new engine monitor to put in the airplane. I got a Dynan D10, which is a tiny little thing, really, about that big. But glancing down there, I can just glance down there and everything is in the green. The RPM is in the green, manifold pressure is in the green, oil temperature is in the green, uh, oil pressure is in the green, fuel pressure is in the green, all this stuff. Just glance down, there it is. And when one of the parameters starts to get out of the green, like one of the temperatures started getting a little hot, then it'll start to give you a little orange flash, a yellow flash, let you know. So it's a tremendous thing. So anyway, I took off out of uh, San Luis Obispo at late dusk, late, late dusk. And I started heading back for Los Angeles direct. And um, I don't normally talk to SoCal, but I was going up high and uh, and direct. So I uh, called into actually talked to LA Center first, I guess. And uh, they gave me a squawk code, and I start going over there. Now, I know up ahead of me are some serious mountains. And I know that I've got the synthetic vision on ForeFlight that I can see the synthetic, uh, see the mountains. And legally, I'm, I'm good to fly because I can see the ground. I'm in contact with the ground, so I'm just flying night VFR. And I climbed to 7,005, which is pretty high for me. But then um, I decided, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody ever colliding with the top of the sky. I'm going to go to 95. So we went to 9,005. But I'll tell you all of this stuff just to tell you this. Uh, this is the picture that we took, that I took, once we got back on the ground, uh, me in the uh, little airplane here. And here's what I want to say about that. When you fly at night, 
over mountainous terrain in a single engine airplane, you would be amazed at how much attention you can pay to an engine monitor. You'd be absolutely astonished at how much attention you can pay to an engine monitor. You would just sit there, I would just sit there, and I would watch that thing like a hawk. Start to see the hottest temperature starting to get, you know, up to 420 or something. Well, let's just come back on the power. Let's, uh, let's enrich in the engine. Let's do all that stuff. Enrich the engine. Let's just, you know, watch it, watch it, watch it. And then all the time, too, there's that little voice in the back of your head. Panic voice usually is on the front of your head screaming, get out of there. But the, uh, the little voice in the back of your head is your instrument rating voice. And it's basically saying things like, um, okay, are you level? Yes, we're level. Are we climbing? No, we're holding altitude. How's our course? We're right on course. dropped a piece of paper uh and then and then you know you're just kind of buttoning down because you've got all these reflections inside the canopy and out there there's nothing but really a lot of black um in any event uh after i uh, see i thought leaving um san luis obispo i thought once i got up to six seven thousand feet i'd be able to see the lights of the la basin but unfortunately uh no i could see scattered lights down there um but i couldn't see the la basin and i was flying for 20 25 minutes before i start to see this uh uh, orange glow up ahead and as this uh, pretty girl and I came out of uh, get closer 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 9,500 then I could see all of the, the San Fernando Valley and once I had the San Fernando Valley made I really relaxed because then I can at least you know put it down on a road or something if I needed to but there was a period there for about um, I don't know 20 minutes where it's like you really have to concentrate now um, there's an old saying about uh, flying at night over rough terrain and that is that the emergency procedures for landing over rough terrain at night is if you have the engine fail you uh, turn on the landing light you uh, basically make sure that there's no problem with the fuel pump or anything crack the canopy uh, get your uh, position ready you get slow down to, to minimum controllable airspeed and then basically you look out the window and if you don't like the terrain then you turn the landing light off um, and that thought was uh, was not escaping me at all so it's uh, it was a it was a great experience actually it was a real bonding experience uh, and the more the more that the plane and I come through events like that, the, the the more confidence I have in it, and that it and that it has in me. But it was um, it was the most uh, let's just say focused flying I've done in a long, long, long time. And it's nice to have you know that instrument training. It's nice to have the ability to uh, just stay on top of all these things. Just the scan, you know, level. Yes, are we turning? No, are we climbing? No, nope, we're good. Are we on course? Yes. How's the engine? Engine looks good. Just around and around and around and around and around again, and then suddenly you can, um, you know, you can practically, with given the amount of light in LA, you can practically uh, almost need sunglasses coming down. So anyway, we had a good time. Uh, the little uh, long easy and me, and uh, that's my little flying story for the today. And so now let's get into the questions because uh, we have to make this relatively brief. I've got uh, I don't know seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. So, beginning, here we go, from uh, Susan Speakman. Hi, Bill. Glad you're back. Thank you, Susan. Glad to be back. What do you think of P.G. O'Rourke's endorsing of Hillary? Betrayal of conservative principles, pragmatic decision-making, tough love for America, or something else? I didn't know that he'd endorsed Hillary until uh, I, I saw the question, uh, Susan. Uh, look, you know, I mean, I want to, my personal reaction would be, first of all, I, I just consider it kind of heartbreaking. But I have a lot of friends who are in the Never Trump camp. And I'm just not. I'm not in the Never Trump camp. I don't think he's a conservative. I have enormous concerns about him. Enormous, enormous concerns about him. But Hillary Clinton watched people die on TV as a result of her not sending um, the relief that Ambassador Stevens wanted. Hillary Clinton has been the most corrupt individual in American politics since she started in, in Watergate. Um, she's, she lied to the American people about this catastrophe, said it was due to a movie, had a filmmaker put in jail for a year. Uh, so putting aside all the Benghazi thing, Hillary Clinton has compromised national security probably in a way that even, um, uh, what's his name didn't, didn't get, Snowden. I mean, this is the Secretary of State who is copying and pasting above top secret special access program information, cutting and pasting it, emailing it to herself on a server in an apartment someplace in New York State, and I think it's all gone. I think all of I think the entire the entire security is gone. And the the very very least, from what I would imagine happens in the intelligence community, we have to assume it's gone. 
right? I mean, if it turns out that she's got all this stuff on such an insecure server and all this stuff is available to be stolen, we have to assume that it's been stolen, which means that we have to restart all of these programs. And my God, it's just treasonable arrogance. Donald Trump hasn't left anybody out to die near as I can tell, and Donald Trump hasn't taken those kind of liberties with national security as near as I can tell. Um, and that's good enough for me. Um, I know principled people on our team who are, uh, they're not going to vote for him, and PJ, PJ Works, obviously one of them, because he perceives, I think, that the, um, that the damage he could do in our name is uh, overwhelms uh, a Hillary uh, another four years of, of Obama and stuff. I'm not sure we can survive another four years of Obama. And I've said many times before, I think the appeal of Trump is that he is the destroyer. I, and, I, and, and people think I'm being demeaning in that way. I'm not really. Um, I'm, I think he is the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. And I think that's what people like about him. I think, they, I think they like the fact that he's a wild card. I think they like the fact that they don't know what he's going to do. They just are going to assume that he's going to do something dramatic. One of the reasons I'm not as worried about this as uh, some of my friends are, as far as Donald Trump uh, misbehaving himself out of there, is if Donald Trump is elected president, all of a sudden there'll be a press corps again. And if there's a press corps again, all of a sudden there'll be a Congress again. Uh, when, when Mitch McConnell says that impeachment for Barack Obama is off the table three years before his term ends, you know, what do you think, what do you think a guy like that's going to do? Why is it off the table? We all know why it's off the table. So uh, impeachment is not off the table for Donald Trump. As a matter of fact, I think the impeachment hounds are, or, or, or vultures rather are going to be circling uh, low uh, as far as Donald Trump is concerned. And, you know, is this fair? No. But having a... Um, a media watchdog back gives me some hope. And he, look, he, people, people think, you know, Donald Trump could just start a nuclear war. You know, he can't, obviously. And neither could, neither could Obama. He can't just walk out one day and say, I've decided to nuke China. It just doesn't work that way. It's just not possible. Um, and I, I will not, I cannot bear the thought of watching that woman get sworn in. She was criticizing Donald Trump for Trump University and how she basically says he lied to the American people. It's like, lady, you have, you have compromised the security of all of us. You've compromised the security of all of us. You've gotten people killed who were fighting to defend the flag that you just don't care enough about. And um, the server, email server thing and Trump University are not equivalent uh, scandals in my mind. In fact, there is no equivalent scandal. People do not understand exactly how much damage this 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 woman has done the the press just won't cover it so look you know i don't have to decide until the day i have to decide but uh i i certainly would never stake out a, a, a never trump position um he's the least he's my least favorite candidate i think he's um i don't think he's a conservative i don't think he really when i say i don't think he wants the job i don't think he expected to get this far and uh most of the things he says off the cuff are alarming however the next day, he walks him back. And a lot of people say, well, that's the problem. But what it really means to me is when he makes one of these uh, faux pas that scares the living daylights out of people, it's not that he's coming in with, um, it's not like he's coming in with this agenda. I think he's just coming in and just shooting blind. And when somebody says, you can't do this, he just backs up and says, okay, well, I'll do something else then. Um, look, I think this is the worst choice that we've had in this country ever, ever. Uh, and I want to see Hillary Clinton go to jail because she deserves to go to jail. And uh, there's only one that there's only one way that's going to happen. And um, Donald Trump is the way. So I look. I I'll close by saying this: the the protections, the constitutional protections built into the structure of our federal government are designed. There she goes. There goes her. There goes her Alfred Hitchcock moment. Uh, she's in every single uh, Stratosphere Lounge show. See you, Carla. Uh, everybody wanted to know if you're going to be making the, 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 the walk, and they all say hi. Um, it's, we have protections against tyranny, uh, and these protections against tyranny would have stopped Barack Obama from ramming Obamacare down our throats, and they would have stopped any number of these erosions of our, of our freedoms. They would have stopped any attack on the Second Amendment. These protections in there, in the Constitution, are designed to protect against tyranny. But if it turns out that the, 
that the Iron Triangle of Democrats in Washington, the news media in New York, and the uh, pop culture in, in Hollywood are determined that the American people are never going to know about any of these things and that the representatives, Republican representatives, are so cowed by not wanting to be seen as uh, racist or, or, or misogynist that they will not act. Then another four years is another four years for them to completely just rot away the foundations of what's left of this thing. And I would rather take a chance with a guy who may in fact be a tyrant because he cannot pull it off here. He just can't. He can't pull it off here because the unlike the previous occupant, the press will be on the job for this guy, and so will the Congress, and um, and that encourages me. So who knows? That's why the vice president pick is really kind of important, I think. All right, moving on. Steve Darrow had a long question, and, uh, and then he followed up with a kind of a second one, uh, which I liked a little better, so I hope that's all right with you, Steve. I've taken the tail end of your, of your uh, two-part question here. Steve Darrow says, um, you voiced your approval for the interstate highway system, NASA, and FAA regulations, along with others that escape my m- memory right now. An argumentative lefty would say that if building roads and exploring space is justified, then building or experimenting on anything else, read solar panels and high-speed rail, is as well. If FAA regulations are justified for flight safety, then banking regulations are as well. Clearly, the highways in the FAA are not among the enumerated powers, so how are these justifiable? Um, well, first of all, let's just break. I'm just going to have to reread it and, and just kind of deal with it right now. Um, so the first point here is if building roads and exploring space is justified, then building or experimenting on anything else, solar panels or high-speed rail is as well. Let's take them one at a time. I think building roads is, in fact, a legitimate, um, a legitimate uh, obligation and a legitimate um, duty for the federal government. I think the I think the interstate highway system was, in fact, uh, one of the most brilliant things we've done in our history. It's the greatest engineering feat in the history of the world, without question. The greatest engineering feat in the history of the world. It's made uh, road travel uh, much, 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 much easier. And and if you think about the cost. Since so much of our goods and services are delivered by truck, if you think about the cost of having to go down like highways like Route 66, I mean, it's saved trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars for everybody in the country. So building roads to me is well within the um, the confines of what I foresee the federal government or perceive the federal government to be able to do. Um, the second one is very different than, than, uh, than building roads, but it's in the same sentence. Uh, exploring space is justified. Listen, here's what I think, here's what I think the, um, the distinction is. A, a wealthy society like ours, I think, shall in fact have a place for the federal government to engage in some kinds of, of basic research. There are some kinds of research that no one will do if it's not done by the federal government. Uh, space probes are one of these things, and I think the supercondu- uh, superconducting super collider was one of these things. Um, I think that is a... It is in the national interest for us to remain at the top of the technology chain. It's not just in the national interest. It is, in fact, the prime national interest. We're outnumbered out there, if you haven't noticed. And uh, and anything that is pure research is, in fact, I think, justifiable, so long as it stays within bounds, right? I mean, NASA is spending $14 billion. You shouldn't spend anything like that. I think you probably do NASA much, much better with probes if you had 3 or $4 billion and you spent it wisely. And that compared to Social Security or something or or, or uh, you know, Medicare is is insignificant. It's, it's, it's just not even there. It's a speck. So the difference between what, what I'm seeing here, um, Stephen, and, and what you're saying is you're saying that if I, uh, you're claiming that you could argue that since I'm saying exploring space is justified by the federal government, then therefore um, solar panels and high-speed rail is as well. But there's a fundamental difference here. Um, high-speed uh, rail is not a technology that, that is... It's not, it's not a technology that only the federal government could do. It's not uh, research. It's, it's engineering, and especially true for solar panels. If you were talking about having a federal a lab or something that was researching solar panels, and they were you know, like, just like, like the NERVA program, they're out in Jackass Flats, Nevada, and you've got a team of 15 guys, and they are using you know, $20, $30 million to see if... They can build a better solar cell, 20 or $30 million over the course of several years. Yeah, I'd probably be all right with that because that would be beneficial for our entire economy and would keep us in the lead 
technologically, but that's not what we're talking about. When Barack Obama takes $500 million and doesn't, he didn't invest it in research. He invested it in a company called Solyndra, which was a for-profit company and is clearly, clearly, clearly the worst case of, of government and business intersecting in a way that's catastrophic. $500 million is starting to be real money. And putting it into a company that's in the manufacturing business and have them take the $500 million and then go out of business is a catastrophe. Probes and things like that, pure science, I think you can make the case for. Um, things like uh, high-speed rail is a commercial enterprise. Likewise, Elon Musk is a commercial enterprise. I think NASA is a customer for Elon Musk. I said before, I don't think NASA should be in the business of running manned space flight. I don't think they should have ever been in the business of running manned space flight. And that if you look at the precursor to the um, FAA, uh, the um, or, or, sorry, the f precursor to, to NASA, uh, NACA, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, they were in fact a pure research company, and they were dividing, they were developing airfoils, they were looking at drag coefficients, they were they were basically spending money to figure out the scientific principles of flight, and all of that research paid for itself thousands of times over, because they simply. Um, they just now if you want a, an airfoil you get the NACA 4902 the lift coefficients drag coefficients all laid out you know exactly how it's done that kind of thing is is appropriate i think for the federal government but making airplanes isn't and if and if NACA or the FAA was manufacturing airplanes and if the FAA was running our airlines like Aeroflot in Russia or uh, rather in the Soviet Union, then we'd have something like the safety record of Aeroflot, and we'd have something like the service of Aeroflot. And all of my friends in aviation say if the FAA had existed in the golden age of flying, then we would as, you know, we'd be traveling from Los Angeles to New York in a four-engine propeller-driven airplane with wood wings holding uh, 30 people flying at 7,000 feet, taking 20 hours and costing $17,000 for a ticket. Um, so, yeah, it's it's kind of a question of the, of the public good. Uh, it's a question of in fact, the actual gen that's it really, right? I mean, really, there it is. The, the general welfare means it, it it's for everybody. The space program benefits everybody. If you're talking about probes now, I'm not talking about um, running the space shuttle, but if you're talking about something like, um, you know, the, the Voyager probes or Galileo or Cassini or, or New Horizons, which are done in cooperation with private, semi-private entities like JPL or Hopkins, you're getting an awful lot of bang for very little buck here. It's, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's worth it just for national prestige, in my opinion. Virtually every picture we have of the solar system is due to Americans, and virtually every picture of deep space is due to Americans from Hubble and, and the Webb Observatories coming online, and uh, you know Huygens and all, all this stuff. Um, uh, not Huygens, Kepler. I think these are worthwhile uh, things and, and good trade-offs, but they don't equal the other. And then there's a second part to this. Um, which is the regulations part. If FAA regulations are justified for flight safety, then banking regulations are as well. That's categorically true. I mean, of course we should have banking regulations. My understanding of the role of the government is to be the referee that enforces a small set of rules. The, the thing that I have a problem with, and most conservatives have a problem, is when the referee starts playing as a player and, and is on a team. You know, when the referee is throwing flags against one's team and, and overlooking uh, fouls on the other, or if the referee just picks up the ball and runs with it into the end zone the same way every time, then you've got a problem. But banking, re bank, banks need regulations. And in fact, if you talk to most bankers, they'll tell you, without of course we want regulations. Without regulations, it's, there's no law. It's, it's ridiculous. Of course we need regulations. The question is, are, they, are those regulations designed to limit um, abuse, or are those regulations designed to socially engineer us in one direction or another, or towards one party or another, and that's no longer a regulation. Now you're talking about political um, fiat. So, yes, FEA regulations are justified. Look, I understand the libertarian position um, regarding things like elevator safety is that uh, every time I say the libertarian position, I always get just a blizzard of mail. But I, let me just say this. I have heard people who call themselves libertarians make the argument that uh, if you would just leave people alone, you don't need elevator inspectors because it's in the interest of every one of the people that run these companies to keep their elevators inspected because of the risk of lawsuits and damages and, and damage to reputation going out of business and all the rest. That's great, but to me that's just as um, idealistic as communism is. People don't behave that way. People, there, Some people do. The people that we care about do. Good, well-run businesses do. 
but not all well-run businesses are not all businesses are well-run many of them are just venal and uh and they would not inspect the uh, elevators if they didn't need to be inspected and that's kind of a you know your fist my nose kind of issue right if you want to if you want to not inspect the elevators in your home i don't care it's not my problem but if i'm going to go into a building to pick up a piece of software or some goods or services or something then I have a reasonable expectation that the building is is maintained in a relatively safe fashion. And if it's not, then that guy's uh, cheapness or laziness or whatever is is impacting me. Um, That's different than an accident, right? It's different than a a one-off accident. Uh, I don't think people can be held responsible for when, you know, a cosmic ray comes down and upsets something. But if it turns out um, that people are slack with maintenance in a public building that the public is in and they're responsible for damages that come to them i think it's pretty pretty straightforward i think you have to have regulations for that likewise for banking um there needs to be some certain regulations about this and and we've seen from experience that things like banks have to have a certain amount of capital um and and a certain amount of that total assets has to be in liquid form and all that other stuff these are reasonable um these are reasonable regulations the regulations that get unreasonable are these uh, environmental regulations, regulations that means that the entire California Central Valley is going to just simply go out of business because we're trying to protect a three-inch sardine. Uh, you know, we just play this game forever. The, the, the level of unreasonable uh, regulations is enormous, but some of them are, are, are essential. Uh, laws regulating uh, aircraft safety on airliners are important. You know, some of these accidents, uh, the value jet accident, and um, I want to say that the Alaska Air uh, MD-80 that went inverted over just off of Point Magoo there and uh, was due to the fact that the jack screw uh, on the on the elevator hadn't been lubricated correctly or something like that, and it just had a runaway uh, pitch uh, error, and the uh, you know, plane just went inverted and went into the ocean. Uh, you know, if you're flying on Alaska Airlines, I think you have a reasonable right to not have that happen to you. And it looks like that was a case of either neglected, uh, uh, neglected or overlooked uh, maintenance. I don't want to say that's the case. I want to say that's my understanding. I don't want to perjure anybody. But there is, in fact, absolutely cases where, you know, some of these fly-by-night airlines are just really taking risks. So, um, Is the FAA part of the enumerated powers? No. Is the Department of Transportation? No. But interstate trade is, and 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 the and the business of business between states is. And I don't think that the FAA is unreasonable. And I don't actually really think that the EPA is unreasonable. If all it was, see, here's here's how I make the distinction. You're probably wondering, well, how am I getting? how am I making these decisions? You know, it's like seems like you want to pick and and cherry pick this and that. But for me, it's pretty simple. If, if it turns out that you really do believe in these kind of fundamental principles, then it is you should be allowed to do anything you want to until it starts to affect other people. And that's what I believe in. So if you are uh, upriver of me and you have a business, that's your business. But if your business is pumping mercury into the river, into the water that I drink, now it's my business. You clearly, in my mind, do not have the right to do that. And somebody has to enforce these rules, and that's what the government is supposed to be here for. So that's how I see it anyway. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get a drum roll here and uh, maybe some bugles or trumpets or something like this. Because Jonathan Kay says this is submission attempt number 10. 10. When I see somebody says my third time or fourth time, uh, I just uh, try to pick up that right away. 10 times. And now we know why. Here's the question. Although I presume on-air discussion will be limited without having seen the episodes in question, I'm still compelled to make the point that a small handful of the more recent episodes in the My Little Pony reboot have extremely strong conservative messaging. Uh, surely if I've learned anything over 100 episodes of the Stratosphere Lounge, it simply must be an example of blowing up blowing up an unguarded bridge that you've alluded to, particularly in the battle space of the show's originally intended child and youth audience. I, for one, can report that with myself as a guiding parental voice to capitalize on the opening. It's working, a, it's working a treat to reinforce such values to my two daughters. She lifts a number of examples, and then apparently, uh, uh, season six, episode seven uh, is one of the ones she lists. An episode centered almost entirely on harassment and bullying, but significantly, the presented solution was not anything from to do with safe spaces. This one in particular seems tailor-made for you, Bill, from the Thunderbirds to Skid. 
look, just watch, you'll see. So if I understand this correctly, um, My Little Pony is in fact uh, providing all kinds of wonderful conservative messages and uh, and that I shouldn't be so hard on My Little Pony. Uh, Steve and Scott and I did a trifecta on My Little Pony and that trifecta was the one that absolutely made uh, the biggest splash ever. It got hundreds of thousands of views. I think we ended up in the My Little Pony documentary movie. I think we're there as, you know, these small-minded conservatives who are, you know, making fun of all these people. Uh, I'll just have to tell you, Jonathan, you say, you say you're the guiding parental voice to, uh, to capitalize on, on helping it out so that your, your little daughters are, are getting the message. Uh, my Little Pony is made for your little daughters. Have no problem whatsoever with My Little Pony made for your daughters. Have no problem with whatsoever with any of this stuff made for, for kids. My problem with My Little Pony is when you have fully grown man-children who will not accept any responsibility, they will not accept any sense of adulthood, they're, they're 30 years old, 25, 30 years old, and they're, they're worshiping a, a show made for little girls. Th th I, I think there's something off about that. One of the greatest minds out there, still out there, and certainly a, a major reason that I'm here, uh, is uh, a guy named Stephen Denbest who was very big when I got started back in 2000, the end of, very, end of 2002, early 2003. Steve Denbest had a blog called USS Clueless, and he wrote the most brilliant, the most brilliant commentary I've ever read. To this day, I still think he was the best of the best. It was relatively funny, but it was insightful and brilliant and original. And uh, and I think Stephen Dembest um, was just a superb mind, an incredible mind. I met him once. Um, he's an agoraphobe, and uh, he's a bit of an odd duck, Steve Dembest is. And then somewhere oh, quite a while ago now, I want to say around 2003, 4, 5, somewhere in there, Steve just gave up the ghost. He gave up on... Um, USS Clueless, he gave up on this insanely brilliant analysis of not just of news and war and stuff, technology, he was just brilliant. USS Clueless was brilliant. And he was one of my, I was on his uh, blog roll for a while. It got me a lot of traffic, got me started. And then Stephen, Stephen didn't leave commentary. He didn't give up on commentary, but Stephen just basically concentrated, I want to say it's chismatic. He, he basically now, his blog and his attention and his time is spent reviewing hentai and anime, Japanese animation. Uh, and um, a lot of it is, you know, uh, certainly a lot of hentai is, is, uh, is certainly is not a big surprise. You know, it's kind of uh, psychosexual kind of stuff. And, and it's kind of, you see people in Japan, you see these Japanese men who go out and they get a, you know, a Coke with a pillow. And the pillow's got the picture of their um, anime or their hentai girlfriend on it. And they talk to the hentai girlfriend and, they, and they've just, you know, they've just um, removed themselves from society and on some level from reality. And I mean no disrespect to Steve Dembest, who I certainly consider to be a mentor of mine and a, and a sponsor of mine. And, a, and I, I certainly couldn't call him a friend, but nevertheless, uh, I would have to say he's, um, he's a, a, a certainly somebody I admire very much. But when I go over there, I'm just appalled. You know, I'm just, I'm just appalled that uh, a, a person with that kind of mind is spending it on this. I think it's just due to a series of emotional problems that the guy has. Um, I, I just don't know what else to say about it. Um, look, I mean, look I mean, look who's talking, right? I mean, we got, we got everything in this whole entire room is Star Trek. Everything in this room is, is, is whimsical and stuff. And I've got, you know, I've got, uh, I've got the Starfleet uniform. I've got the, you can see the Gorn captain here. You know, I've got Dave Bowman on the back wall. So, you know, you can certainly make the case that I'm, I'm certainly a fan and nerd and a geek and all that other stuff, but it doesn't prevent me from doing my adult work. I guess that's where I'm trying to go. Uh, if all I did was talk about Star Trek and all I did was just sit here and, 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 and you know, break down, uh, you know, patterns of force or, or, or talk about, you know, uh, technological errors in uh, Charlie X or, you know, whatever, then, then I think I'd be wasting, I think I'd be wasting my, my intellect. I think I'd be wasting my life, actually. There's one thing between a hobby and an obsession, and the, and the My Little Pony guys that I've seen are just obsessed. They're kind of like the furries. Look, these people don't cause any harm. It's not like I'm up like, my God, we've got to stop these people. I, I never said we have to stop them. I'm, I don't believe in any kind of coercive force at all. I think you're free to do whatever you want to do in this country. If you want to be a, a brony, great. You want to be a, a, a furry, great. But 
Um, I think it's arrested development to see a 35-year-old man whose entire life centers around My Little Pony. I think it's nuts. I still think it's nuts. I think it's time that some of us grew up a little bit. And again, see, this is why I don't consider myself a hypocrite. This is as whimsical and as and as flighty and as and as and as adolescent and boyish as any room I've ever seen in my life. But it does not prevent me from being an adult. It does not prevent me from doing my job. It does not prevent me from going out on on actual dates with real grown-up women. It doesn't prevent me from maximizing what I'm doing with my life. And if all I did was sit around and, and, and talk Star Trek, I think it would. I think it'd be a terrible waste of the limited talent that I have. And when I see Steve Ben Den Best and I see the depth of that mind going into that kind of detail where you certainly, look, you, you can't write the kind of detail that he writes about without understanding that I'm th- quite sure he made a decent amount of money as, a, as an engineer, worked an awful lot on cell technology. I think he might have been a big part of cell phone technology. So he's watching hours of this, hours, every day, I would say, hours of it. I'm sorry, I, I, that's different than having a hobby or different than, you know, Halloween or... See, like, again, I'm, I don't mean to beat this to death here, but uh, there's a word that it took me a while to figure out what it meant, but it's called uh, cosplay, and it's costume play. Cosplay is when you see people dressed up as, um, you know, video game characters or... Or, cart- uh, or comic book characters and stuff. I think cosplay is cool. I, I mean, I've been to Comic-Con a number of... Well, I've been there once. I've seen a lot of video from Comic-Con. And I think cosplay is awesome. And I do. I used to do a little of it myself. I'd go out on Halloween, get dressed up as Captain Kirk, and great. But I did it when I was, you know, 20. And, and it wasn't my entire life. And for most of these people, for most of these people, cosplay is, in fact a hobby in the way that you and I would consider a hobby. It's not their entire lives. For some of them, it is. So, yeah, uh, while I, uh, listen, I'm, I'm willing to take the point, Stephen. Um, I'm willing, I'm sorry, Jonathan, I'm willing to take the point that My Little Pony is actually providing uh, uh, conservative messaging, and I think that's swell. And if it's providing conservative messaging for little girls or little boys even, fine. But I don't think, um, I don't think that, uh, there's something particularly about My Little Pony that I find unmanly. And I'm sorry, that's just the way I feel about it. I just find it just disturbingly unmanly to see 30-year-old men just sitting there watching every single episode about these, you know, it's about cinnamon cupcake and, you know, and you just I just don't. I'm sorry. That's the way I feel about it. Um, so anyway, ten, uh, 10 efforts to get the, the question answered, and it's answered. Moving on to the less critical issues of the day. Kevin Jordan uh, says, uh, Bill, I have been feeling unbearably depressed lately. Really? Why? Mentally and physically, despite having so much in my life and a family that I'm eternally grateful for. I think recent politics is some of it, work, stress, being underwater, etc. I need to be better for my wife and kids. This is me asking someone who I know has lived in that place before, how do you know a shortcut back to happy and healthy? Um... Well, let's start uh, with the basics here, since this is actually a very serious question, uh, Kevin. If you are, um, if you, if your childhood was more or less normal and relatively loving and giving and you know and, and, and nurturing and so on, then almost certainly you don't have a biological um, issue. Uh, kids that are deprived of that, in fact, have a have a, a brain chemistry deficit, uh, lack of lack of uh, parental attention and cut, touching and a lot of closeness and stuff, uh, that kind of neglect rather than abuse. In many cases, psychologists will tell you neglect is worse than abuse because at least an abused kid is aware that he's there. A neglected kid has no interaction whatsoever and it's, it really sets up a lot of problems. So the reason I'm starting here is because um, I'm going to assume that you, when you say feeling unbearably depressed lately, it's because of the external... Um, environment and not because of the brain chemistry. Um, if it turns out that you have a, a brain chemistry issue, then you trying to be happy is like telling a diabetic that he should stop writhing on the floor in, in a diabetic coma. You just need to buck up. Buddy, I don't care whether you're in, in, in insulin shock. Just man up and get up and, uh, you know, bite the bullet and, and, and get back to work. 
uh, clinical depression, biological depression is pretty much the same thing. If you if you have had the uh, environment or whatever that caused you to um, to have uh, that kind of a of a deficit, you c it's measurable. Your your serotonin levels are down, or your dopamine levels are down, and and you simply are grinding metal when you should have a fairly well lubricated uh, transmission in there. That's not your fault, and uh, medication is tremendously effective at getting. Um, at getting you back to a normal, more or less normal brain chemistry. I see Scott Ott has joined us. Uh, Scotty, uh, we showed um, news actually. I don't know if you were here for that, but people seem to love it. Uh, I certainly loved it, and um, I'm going to be working on your opening graphics real soon. I think we'll probably premiere that show next week, old, old boy, because uh, I just couldn't be happier with it, Scott. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so here's where I'm starting with that, uh, Kevin. If it turns out that you've got a, um, a brain chemistry problem, then then it doesn't matter really whether the, 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 the environment is simply exacerbating you know, your depression. Um, I am one of those guys with those kind of problems. I'm one of those guys who just, you know, I'm a court low. I'm a court low on serotonin, and I'm, and I'm a court low on, on dopamine. And, and when I uh, have to, you know what it's like? It's, it's kind of, yeah, you ever drive a car? Um, one of these days we'll be asking that question, period. Do you ever drive a car? But I used to own cars that were so um, awful and, and expensive that you had to put almost as much oil into them as you put gas into them. You had to put oil in there every couple of days. Um, so uh, if, you've, if you're suffering from clinical biological depression, you need to take antidepressants to keep the oil levels up or else you're going to start grinding metal. Now let's just assume that that's not the case because I think you're saying, you're, most of what you're saying here is, um, is external. It's the environment. Uh, politics, uh, unbearably depressed about the future of the country, uh, you know, um, being underwater is stress, all the rest of it. So putting the biology aside now that we got that stated, um, now we're talking about something that's different. Um, an environmental depression is something, look, I, I think everybody who's watching this show has that feeling. I think there's, I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't wake up and look at Drudge Report or Instapundit or something and just say, I simply cannot believe this is happening to this country. Can't believe it. I, I, it can't get worse than this. And then the next day it does. It gets worse and worse and worse. Watching something you love that's precious and rare being destroyed in front of your eyes is depressing and it's enough to make you angry. It's enough to make you genuinely nuts. It's enough to make you simply nuts. And I feel that all the time. Uh, one of the things that has kept me going, not one of the things, the thing that's kept me going, because I have to get really deep into this, you know, I mean, this is where I live, Kevin, I'm out there. Um, I have to filter this stuff, I have to go kind of into the depths of the worst of these stories and try to make some sense out of it, not try, not only try to make sense out of it, try to make sense out of it and try to keep it somewhat optimistic, because that's my job. Um, but it's brutally hard. Scott uh, is here now. He's watching the show, and Scott and I have had many conversations about just how um, depressing and, 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 and awful it is to deal with this stuff. I've, I've called Scott once or twice from the car just saying, Scott, i got to talk to somebody because I don't know if I can take it anymore. Honestly, I don't. So the, the first thing I would say is get, get checked up. Make sure that you, know, you don't have a biological problem because that's, that's a tough hole to climb out of if you've got that kind of a, of a, of a deficit. The second thing I would say is find some friends to talk to, you know. I've called Scotty on days when I was just feeling just like that's it. That's it. It's over. It's just, just over. Why are we even wasting time talking about it anymore? And then you talk to guys like Scott and, you know, or anybody who's a friend of yours and you feel better. You get it out of your system. Sometimes you just have to get it out of your system. A lot of times uh, these thoughts that we don't get to talk about, they just build up a pressure all their own because there's no one we can really talk to about them. We get kind of in this sort of a, you know, like a feedback loop. We run around, 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 and sometimes you just have to crack a window and let some air in there. And talking to friends is very, very good at that. Um, and I think there is an even easier answer here, uh, especially to the... Um, to the sense of being underwater and, and the stress and the, and the work hours. Uh, I, took, I took a vacation last summer for the first time in I think probably eight years. I don't think over eight years I'd been away for more than three days and that was a speaking engagement. Um, you know, I would go to Coeur d'Alene for 4th of July, I'd be gone for two nights, three nights, that was it. But um, last year I went to Oshkosh, I was gone for eight nights, almost, almost nine, maybe 10, maybe I was gone for 10 days. And I remember thinking, I simply can't leave for 10 days because if I do leave for 10 days, this business is going to spin out of control. And if the business spins out of control, 
then the world is, will will wobble on its axis, and um, and I'm not going to get uh, I'm going to not going to have any money, and the paychecks are going to stop, and be out on the street, and everybody's going to die and starve, and all the rest of it. And Victor Portelli comes up with the smod reference, and we get to the point where you're just praying for the sweet meteor of death just to get it over with. But that this is getting to the nub of what I'm trying to say here, uh, Kevin. When you're in a pit, um, it's hard to see that you're in a pit. When you're in a pit, it's nothing but black. The, the, the hole is, the only sunlight you see is directly above you in a tiny little hole, and you feel like you are in the pit forever, and there's no way out of the pit. Uh, on the other hand, if you're standing uh, on ground looking down into a pit, you can see that a pit is actually a pretty limited amount of space, that a pit is an artificial space, that there is, in fact, plenty of sunlight out there. If you've got a guy standing on the outside of a pit and another person down at the bottom of a well, the world, the actual reality of the world outside hasn't changed. There's just as much sun as there would be for both of them. The sun is out, the the, the grass is blowing, the uh, the wind is blowing, the, the, the grass is, smells great. It's just that the person out of the pit can perceive it, the person in the pit can't. But it doesn't mean that they're living in separate realities. So a fair amount of this finding a way to get back to being happy is getting out of the pit. And getting out of the pit is usually a matter of getting out of whatever particular rhythms or habits or ruts you are in that are that are getting you depressed so if it turns out that you're um that you're losing you're just losing your marbles and i feel this way very often uh and and you wake up in the morning you read drudge and you just go i can't believe i just i simply can't believe that this is happening then don't read drudge or at least don't read it in the morning i find that if i read uh, you often i'll just wake up and in that kind of um dream state between being fully awake and fully asleep which is where i spend most of my time if I get news, then it, it has a much more profound impact on me. Um, and that's why all of the trouble I've ever gotten into, excuse me, th that I felt bad about was because I reacted in the morning. I I'll wake up, I'll see some kind of comment or something from a fan or a friend in, um, on Facebook. And it's, a, it's like a minor criticism. If it's the first thing I see when I wake up, I'll just go ballistic. So, so don't read nasty stuff when you wake up. And if it turns out it's bugging you later in the day, don't read it at all. Um, and, and getting out of the pit means, um, getting out of the rut means using your friends more. And, and if it turns out that they're not helping you, then you got to get some different friends and do some things. One of the things, though, I think that really helps me the most, certainly, is this. You have to, you have to, this is, this is actually like a uh, kind of a get out of jail free card that I keep in my wallet here. Every time I think that the world's about to end and that America's done for and freedom's done for and no matter how hard we try, we can't stop these people, all of this. Every time I think about those things, I'm reminded of how much more serious and desperate life has been for most Americans, for virtually all of our history. We are, people like you and me, are unfortunate in one level because being born in the 50s and 60s and 70s, life started for us so well. We, we really kind of came into the world in America at the sort of the peak of its powers, and, and, and things have gotten worse since then. But to say that they've gotten worse since they were in, you know, 65 or 63 or 73 or whatever, to say that that means the end of the world is, is just going a little bit step too far. And where I'm going with this is this. If you think about life in America and how depressing it can be today, think about what life in America was like in 1942. You know, um, just this last Christmas, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and they didn't just attack Pearl Harbor. They destroyed all of our bases in the Philippines. They attacked Guam. They attacked Wake Island. They attacked Midway. They attacked all of Southeast Asia. The Singapore has fallen. The British are out of the fight. The British send battleships down there. They're destroyed by Japanese air power. The Japanese are rolling everywhere, and there's no way to stop them. And Hitler owns all of Europe, and the only thing left standing there is a little bit of the Red Army. The Red Army's been pushed back 400 miles, 500 miles, 800 miles. And, and those people thought, well, the end of the country is coming for sure, and it's going to come in the form of machine guns and bombs. This jug narcissist is not a threat to this country in the way that communism was or Nazism was. It's, um, it's, it's a product of Obama and progressivism is a product of too much prosperity, too much security. And so one way you can look at it is their policies will eventually mean that the prosperity and the security goes away. And then we're going to need everybody we can who's good in emergencies. We're going to need people that know how to shoot and people know how to farm and people who know how to ration and okay it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how bad things are uh, or how bad they'll get 
Kevin, you know, the only thing that actually matters in the world is how, how you're going to respond to it. What are you going to do? Uh, I've made the case so many times before, I'm not going to go into it again, but I genuinely actually believe that we are sitting here today speaking English in the West and, and enjoying freedom and, and so on because one guy named um, Winston Churchill woke up and decided to, no, I'm not going to give up. I really genuinely believe it. I think you can certainly make the case. If if Churchill had not been the prime minister and Britain had had surrendered to this, not to the degree that France had, but basically collaborated with, with Germany and Hitler turned his full powers on Russia, he would have beaten Russia because he damn near beat him anyway. And if, if Hitler beats Russia, then cools his jets for three or four years, then with all of Europe and and Europe's industry under his feet, with Imperial Japanese as allies, with Russian manpower off the table, then you can make a pretty good case that it's just a matter of time until the United States is done. You know, it's 150 million people we had, but he'd probably have, you know, you throw Russia in, you know, millions, almost, you know, almost a billion people. So Winston Churchill woke up and said, no, of course we're outnumbered, of course we're, we're, uh, in trouble. We thought we'd be fighting the Nazis 200 miles away with France, the biggest army in Europe, but now we don't have France. They're not 200 miles away, they're 20 miles away. And uh, there's no reason to believe we're ever going to win this fight ever, but we're going to, that's what we're going to believe. We're going to act that way. And and all the great historical stories, all the stories of, um, the, the kind of stories of courage uh, that always motivate me so much are, are stories of, of the determination to fight and win despite incredible odds. Now, the Alamo is a story like that, but unfortunately the Alamo didn't turn out so well from the point of view of the Americans. But uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this particular story, but um, I think the, the greatest moment of the, of the British Empire, well, Battle of Britain, okay, but prior to that uh, was the Battle of Rourke's Drift. It was a small fight, really. Uh, Rourke's Drift was... Um, for those of you not familiar with the story, if you see the movie Zulu, by the way, which is a superb movie, it made 1960-something, Michael Caine's first movie, uh, it's absolutely incredible. And the reason it's so incredible and so ahead of its time and the reason Zulu holds up so well is because even though it was made in the 60s, the, the writers and the filmmakers took the Africans seriously and treated them as people. They weren't just dark savages. They were warriors, and they had their own leaders, and they had their own tactics. They had their own strategy. They had tons and tons and tons of courage. So it's a fantastic movie, holds up even today. But the story of Rourke's Drift is this. There was a, a, a trading post in um, in the Natal, I think, uh, called Rourke's Drift. It was just a, a couple of, you know, th- thatched buildings and a couple of walls, a little kind of almost like a Dolby thing, looked kind of like a European structure. And there was a barn, and then there was a corral, and it was on the side of the river, and it was called Rourke's Drift. And the British Army went through there, and they were on their way to go and uh, knock off... Uh, Sitoweo? I cannot pronounce that name. The Zulu king. It's not quite Sitasaweo. It's something very close to that. And so the British are going to march in there and straighten these Zulus out and show them what it's all about because the British are never defeated. They're the most powerful force in the world in 1879, I want to say, somewhere in there. And so they go marching in. They, they go right through Rourke's Drift. They leave a little garrison there, a couple hundred guys, and then they go in after the giant Zulu army and, uh, and the Zulu king wipes them out to a man. Um pretty much to a man on the battle of Islan Lawala Isan Lawala. Uh it's a just a mesa. Isan Lawala is I'm mispronouncing that too. I used to get these right. Uh it was just a slaughter. I mean they put fifteen hundred British there and the and the Zulus just overran them. So far so good, right? I mean now Rourke's Drift is this. The the entire main force of the British Army has been killed. Every one of them's just been killed, stabbed to death, and they're they're just corpses on the ground. Guys ride back to Rourke's Drift, where there's something like 130 men, 160 men, something like that, and they say the entire Zulu army is coming after us, 8,000, 9,000 warriors, something like this, and they're going to be here in three hours because the Zulus could run almost as fast as a horse. They could run for five, ten hours and and go right into battle. It's the kind of shape they were in. Um, so these guys run back, and, and what happens? You got these two British army officers. They're not generals. They're not. They're not colonels. They're not majors. They're nothing. They're just lower, lower level guys. Two lieutenants, uh, uh, Chard and Bromhead. Chard was a royal engineer, and he outranked Bromhead by about a day or two. He was commissioned like two or three days before Bromhead, who ostensibly was the military guy. So Chard, Chard, the uh, royal engineer, takes Setaweo. Thanks. Uh, so, so Chard, the engineer, royal engineer, takes command of this um, of this little garrison and starts to turn 
what is essentially just a mission outpost into a fortress, a defensible fortress. He starts piling up these melee bags, and he and he has a he has a second fallback position. He's got a third fall, fallback position. He's got coverage on this. He's got shooters over here. He's doing everything he can. The Zulus come in from San Luana, eight thousand strong, and they start their their war chants and they start this terrifying dance and this Zulu this really low pitch kind of thing, and. Uh, and they start advancing on on Rourke's Drift, and and um, Chard, a uh, Chard, and Bromhead, and and the rest of these guys just start. They get out the Martini Henrys, and they, st- which is a single a single bullet rifle. It's a breech loader, but it's not it's not a bolt action. Well, it is a bolt action, but it's not it's not like there's a, a clip in there. It's one bullet goes in, bolt, <laughs> unload, another bullet. The damn bullets are like the size of these. Um, uh, grenade launchers. I mean, they're just this, this slug is so huge. It just guys are just getting broken shoulders firing these things, and so the Zulus keep coming on, and then they stop, and the and the fire pushes them back, and then they come in from a different direction, and they push them back, and then they start shooting down from the heights, and they push them back, and then the Zulus come over the fence, and now these guys are inside the wire, so to speak, and now they go back, they fall back to another position where he's got Char to set up a uh, like a redoubt inside there, where everybody now the survivors, 120 or 30 of them or something, is is clustered inside an area the size of this studio. At, or, or smaller, and they just keep fighting. And finally, finally, the Zulus just say, "This tough, this nut is too tough to crack. We're going to go." And the chances of them surviving that, uh, by on paper, are zero. Right? I mean, it's zero. Eight, 160 guys to 8,000. You know, at night. Come on. But they didn't look at it that way. Uh, Chard and, and Bromhead. Uh, decided that this position was defensible. They made a plan, and they stuck to the plan. And they innovated, and they improvised when things started going off uh, script. The Zulus got into one of these buildings, a hospital building, and the walls were made out of such thin, kind of a crummy adobe that you could take a bayonet or a, a soggy spear, and you could simply start making a hole in the wall so these zulus get in on one side and they're coming through the building but they're not coming from the outside where they got coverage they're literally they're literally going through the walls um and uh yeah bindlestiff says clip you've triggered me it was a clip in uh not a magazine on things like the gewehr 98 that's a clip it's a stripper clip um anyway they fight to the last to the last man, and the casualties were actually relatively light. I want to say they lost twenty or thirty people. However, the point of all this is this: uh, the British equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor is the Victoria Cross, and more Victoria Crosses were awarded that day than any other day in the history of the British Empire, and that includes days in World War One where you might have a hundred thousand guys on the field, the hundred and sixty-eight guys there, or something like that number. I forget the number of Victoria Crosses. I want to say it was twenty-four, twenty-three, twenty-four, something like that they just didn't give up and so not only did they win that battle but they had um they had won the battle of of the mythology they'd won they they won the battle of history and hope so they didn't just beat the uh, zulus they beat the zulus in a way that encourages all the rest of us to understand that we can fight and beat enormous odds enormous odds it's not about the numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's not about the weapons. It's not about the, the tactics. It's about the heart. It's about morale. It's about courage. And um, and uh, Ohio Coastie just brings up a great example. Rourke's Drift is, in fact, like the Spartans in uh, Ther- Thermopylae. 300 was a tremendous movie. I know it was a cartoon, but I don't care. I loved it. I loved, loved, loved it. I loved the effect that 300 had on 15-year-old boys coming out of the theaters. They were saying, yeah, the Spartans are like the Marines and the... And the, and the um, you know the Persians are like the are like the Muslims, and and you know these guys were just in such great shape. And I've said this before, but if you look at the movie Three Hundred, a lot of people really put it down because they're saying it's like gay porn because um, Leonidas and all these um, Spartans are in literally unbelievable shape, and they're the kind of shape that a Western civilization, 21st century nutrition and exercise, can get you into. None of those guys look like that, and so why did he do it? Well, I think the director did it because he wanted to show he wanted to show on the outside the discipline that they developed on the inside. I think that's why these guys were such incredibly ripped actors playing the roles. They were such supermen on the outside because he couldn't show 
the years and years and years and years and years of deprivation and discipline that the Spartans had internally, so he had to show it externally. You would see these guys, you say, my God, these are supermen. Well, they were, but they were supermen because of what had happened on the inside. Um, these last stand stories are really important um, because they show us that sometimes you lose, you know, Custer loses, sometimes uh, the Alamo you lose, but sometimes you win, and, um, and you're not going to win if you don't fight. That's the lesson I'm trying to impart here on all of this, Kevin, is uh, no matter how depressed you get about all this stuff, and you may think that our chances of winning are slim, and sometimes I think that too, but our chances of winning are zero if we give up. Our chances of winning are zero if we just give up. And despair is what they want from us. They want us to be filled with despair. It's not accidental. The, the reason this iron triangle of Democrats in Washington news media in New York and, and storytellers in Hollywood are trying so hard to tell every single one of us that we're dustbin of history and that, you know, our time has passed and we're dinosaurs and you need to get with the program is because they want us all to be despairing and give up. That's a great strategy. I don't blame them one bit. Um, Iron Kid uh, brings up another great, great example in history that, that I had forgotten as well. And that's Agincourt. You know, the British uh, meet a French force. The actual numbers are in some dispute, but I want to say it's something like 1,500, 1,600 British soldiers and archers under King Henry V going up against a number of something like 20,000, 50,000, 70,000 French, something shocking like that. And they just beat them. They beat them because of strategy. They beat them because the, cause Henry understood the way they were going to fight. He had the British longbow. It's not just enough to have the longbow. You have to have a strategy so that the longbow causes these Frenchmen to panic and causes them to force themselves into such a small area and funneled them into such a small area that the French knights, armored knights, you know, longbowmen are no match for these guys in close quarters. Henry figured out a way to get them funneled in so tightly that they couldn't, sw literally couldn't swing their weapons. And then they just shot them to pieces. And, um, and so, you know, courage is important and brains is important. And mostly uh, stamina is important. Mostly um, perseverance. It's perseverance. It's true for anything. I think it was Calvin Coolidge talked about that. He said, you know, perseverance is the, in, is the um, essential quality. Genius isn't going to do it. Unrewarded genius is everywhere. Um, you know, I forget hard work, whatever. He said, persistence. Just got to keep getting in there. So uh, that's why I'm so proud to do the work I do to the degree that I can uh, have an effect on people. It's made me extremely proud, and uh, the comments I get the most often are the ones I like the most. And uh, people will come up to me occasionally in an airport. And by the way, if you if you are one of those people who happen to see me in an airport or, or in Vegas or something, by, by all means, please come up and say hi. Uh, no matter what I'm doing, just come up and say hi. Um, but the comments I get are you 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 um, you give me ammunition that I can argue with over the water cooler, or I thought I was the last person in the world who had this kind of sense of common sense or, or you've got the kind of clarity on issues that just cuts right through all of these you know progressive sophistry and you make me realize no we're right after all it's like well that's what I that's what I'm here for I think and um, and it's certainly an honor to be a part of that so Kevin I'm gonna let this one go now but I just tell you this uh, uh, first of all if it turns out that you really can't shake this just uh, send me an email directly uh, send it to e info at billwhittle.com it'll go to my uh, it'll go to Carla and then she'll get it to me and we'll talk. Um, but uh, hopefully this will help because, you know, we're in this together, man, and that's it. And if you're feeling depressed, it's because, you you know, and, 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 and underwater and all the rest of it, it's because you're talking to people who don't really get it. You talk to guys like Scott Ott, you talk to anybody here in the Stratosphere Lounge, it's, it's a mutual encouragement thing. That's why, that's why Rourke's Drift worked. Chard thought they were going to die, but the people watching Chard said, my God, he thinks we're going to win this thing. All right, then, if he believes it, then I believe it. That's what leadership is. Leadership is going out there with uh, with an attitude like we're going to kick their asses when you inside feel like we don't have a chance here. Well, we don't have any chance if we don't fight, so if we're going to fight, we're going to have to fight bravely, and if we're going to fight bravely, it's up to the leader to put some morale into these people. I'm the leader. It's my job, so I'm going to go out there, and we're going to I'm going to pump these guys up. I think that's so exactly what Churchill did and, and what all of these great leaders do. They have... Um, they have the they make the moral decision to accept the fact that while defeat may be likely it's certain if you don't fight and so let's fight and so many times 
small groups of people fighting tenaciously for their lives have such an impact on large forces that the large forces will break. It is morale. The, the Spartans held those Persians off, million Persians or whatever, for days. Uh, Rourke's Drift, you know, they could have kept going. Works, they, obviously, if, they, if the Zulus had spent their last man, they would have killed everybody there. But after, after the garrison there of 200, 150 guys killed two, 3,000 of these Zulus, the Zulu king said, eh, wasn't actually set away. It was uh, one of the princes. He just basically said, no, I don't think so. I think this is costing us way too much money. If it, if it costs us 3,000 guys to kill 20 of them and there's 160 of them left, uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think this is worth it. That's a win. So hang in there, buddy. Um, this one I can answer rather quickly. Are we doing on timer? Yeah, it's about time for me to go. Um, Dave Olson, our friend, is always some, such a big part of this, says, uh, SpaceX has now landed three rockets on a barge at sea. Will they continue to increase their index of human awesomeness, or will we become complacent when they keep sticking the landings? And the reason I wanted to take that question, Dave, is that when we become complacent, that's when we win. Uh, we're no longer amazed that an airliner lands safely. Uh, we're amazed when an airliner doesn't land safely. We're astonished and shocked. Uh, people who are afraid of flying, uh, we haven't had a fatal accident on a major carrier in 15 years. It'll be 15 years in September. 15 years of 30,000, 40,000 flights a day and not a single crash of, a, of, a, of an American carrier with, a, you know, with an actual jet. We had one. It happened right after September 11th. It was a, the, the American Airlines crash DC, uh, in Airbus crashed in New York, and that was the clock reset. And since then, it's been almost 15 years, and we haven't had a single fatality on a major um, airliner. We came pretty damn close um, when uh, Captain Sullenberger lost both engines climbing out of um, LaGuardia. But, you know, coolness under pressure and training, courage, competence, and skill meant that that record is still holding because he got every single one of them out of there. Uh, and that's all that really matters. So um, when when the extraordinary becomes commonplace and boring, Dave, that's when you've succeeded. Uh, when, I mean, air travel used to be unspeakably dangerous. And if you read uh, Fate is the Hunter, um, it was about the very first days of commercial aviation right after World War II. You'd find out these guys were losing an airplane a week. They'd lose a crew and the people on board a week. Uh, where is Johnson and Edwards? Uh, they flew in a mountain in, in Montreal. Oh, okay. What happened to these guys? Well, they were killed. Uh, looks like a rudder, um, you know, departed the airplane over the South Pacific. Okay. Um, we learn, they say uh, federal aviation regulations are written in blood. It's really true. Uh, you know, we, if, if the best you can hope for, I think, I think certainly the case with the Virgin uh, crash, the Virgin America spaceship two crash. You, it's to me, it's unreasonable that you will not make mistakes and kill people. I think there is a minimum cost of lives that has to be paid, because if you're doing something new, you're making mistakes that no one's made before, and you won't know what they are until you make them. And some of them you'll get lucky on, and some of them you won't. And the only thing that's unforgivable in a, in an environment like that is to make the same mistake twice. That's that's paying extra. Now you're now you're adding interest. Um, to, to, to the bill uh, and you're making unforced errors you can't really go up and make the same mistake twice you have to go up and make a new mistake now um, one of the things they say in uh, one of the things my flight instructor said to me real early was uh, uh, Bill you know um, learn from other people's mistakes because you're not going to live long enough to make them all yourself that's right I read accident reports and I say oh I shouldn't have done this and I was up there over the mountains last uh, couple nights ago in a single engine airplane in the dark, I was thinking I should not have put myself in this situation. And I don't think I'll put myself in that situation again, but at the same time, I was thinking, I did know that this was a possibility and I did think that this was well within my capabilities and it is well within my capabilities, so, you know, it was memorable and, uh, and I had to focus, but it was, I don't think it was ever dangerous. I don't, certainly I wasn't ever in a space of like, my God, what's gonna happen? It was just, all right, just keep it under control and don't hit anything. Um, so the, I think actually, Dave, the problem is simply that we're, that we're going so slowly um, that uh, we're, we're trying to avoid paying the price at all. And therefore, we're not only going to pay the price, but we're not going to get what we want. We're not going to get what we're paying for. Progress costs lives. 
and and there are people who do the flying who are fully prepared to take that risk. They were prepared to take that risk in the 60s. They are prepared to take that risk in the in the dawn of aviation. You know, most of those guys who, who went up in those crates were killed. Uh, Orville Wright was very nearly killed. He has a terrible crash. He took, it never really fully recovered, but they're prepared to take the risk. It's not a suicide mission, but it's dangerous. I forget what the number of original um, male pilots, when they first started flying male in the late 20s and 30s, they're flying in sleet. There's no navigational systems. They're literally looking, they're literally flying underneath the scud levels 200 feet above the ground, trying to read the name of the town off of the water tower. And these guys were losing one out of every four guys, you know, and I understand that during the golden age of test flight out in Edwards Air Force Base, the chance of a test pilot coming back from a mission was was 75 percent. He had a 25 percent chance of not coming home every time he went up. You run those odds, it's it's murder. Um, but we don't make the mistakes that we made then. We we made new mistakes. And with civil aviation, as far as civil aviation, civil aviation is concerned, the fact that we've gone 15 years without a fatality is an indication that we have about run out of mistakes. That's not to say we won't find something new. We will. But we have certainly made all of the common mistakes, and we've made most of the outlying mistakes, and we've also understood how mistakes are made. Some of the procedures that they put into place in um, commercial aviation cockpits have since been moved into the, into the uh, operating room by pilots who happen to be doctors because uh, one of the things, this is a perfect example actually, one of the things that, um, one of these regulations written in blood is the idea of a sterile cockpit. And what that means is it is now against uh, FAA regulations, kind of a nice tie into earlier, for a commercial crew, a pilot and co-pilot, it is against regulations, and they can lose their license over this, to talk about anything other than the flying at hand during critical flight phases like uh, taxi out, take off, landing, and so on. If... E because looking at the black boxes and listening to the voice recorders, we found out that entire airplanes full of people, 140 people, died because the pilot and the co-pilot were talking about a date that he was about to have, and they were so into that aspect of it that they forgot to set the flaps for takeoff or something like that. So now um, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Now the only conversation that's allowed during these critical flight phases is conversation directly related to the flight. That's... a that has saved lots of people, lots of people. That mistake not only did we not have to make again, but we basically eliminated any number of upcoming mistakes because of things like that. And when they take it to the to the uh, to the operating room, things like checklists, things like um, having to get verbal confirmation from other team members, then you find out that the number of errors in the surgical uh, uh, wards goes way way down, and way down. You're not amputating the wrong leg anymore because now you've got a co-pilot surgeon who says. We're going to confirm now on our checklist that we are, in fact, going to amputate the right leg. And he says, well, I'm kind of prepping the left leg. Well, we got a little problem here, sir. It works. So, um, and it works because we paid for it. It worked because, because we found out why people died when we didn't do it that way. And as I say, we're running out of, we're running out of errors in commercial aviation. We're now at the point where 15 years of, uh, of an unbroken safety record is telling me that uh, we've gotten all the demons pretty much wrung out of the system. Nothing is really going to come at us as just like, what? I don't think. And that's not to say we won't have mistakes, but we'll have mistakes that will be, shouldn't have done that, as opposed to what the hell happened. By the way, they say um, they say that if you're, if you're killed as a pilot and you go to the pearly gates, there's one of two answers that you're going to get, or questions rather, that you're going to get from St. Peter, and one of them is okay and the other one's not. If you um, if you get up to the to the pearly gates after you've been killed in a plane crash, and St. Peter says to you, hey, tough break, kid, then okay. You got hit by a meteorite or, or, or a, a, an elevator fell off or some part failed that we didn't know before. Tough break, kid, you know, sorry it had to be you, but, you know, dems the brakes. On the other hand, if he says, what were you thinking? That's a whole different animal. You should have known better, and you did know better, and you did it anyway. That's just stupidity as opposed to bad luck. Anyway, um, yeah, two to three to go. I think we can probably do. Um, Michael Silva Sandim, Sandim says, "Hey, Bill, Canadian millennial fan here. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Just wanted you to know. Just wanted to know what you thought about Milo Yiannopoulos recently being shut down into speaking event at DePaul University last week. It was the first time he actually had to cancel an event. Do you think the rising backlash is a good thing or a bad, a good sign or a bad sign?" 
Also, when do we get to see you talk with Stefan Molio again? I personally really miss those discussions. Me too. Had an awful lot on my plate, but we'll be bringing those back uh, once things settle down a little around here. So, uh, look, I think Milo Yiannopoulos is one of the most powerful pieces on the board. I think he's unbelievably effective, and that's why he has to be destroyed. You can't have an openly gay person Republican like in the same way that you can't have famous movie star women being Republican, in the same way that you can't have black people being Republican, because it destroys the narrative. And the narrative is that the Republicans are the racists and they're the misogynists and they're the homophobes. And, and if you have a gay Republican, then that makes it a lie. And if that gay Republican is getting tremendous support from his supposedly, uh, you know, homophobic base, then that also destroys the narrative. And if the fact that this uh, homosexual, you know, flagrantly homosexual guy is in fact being shut down and bullied by people on the left, the progressives, that also is a pretty powerful lever of truth to wield against these people. The genius of, of Milo is that is that he understands he understands the way the game is played in terms of the victimhood hierarchy and he just plain runs with it. Uh, I think he probably understands the media better than anybody I've seen since Andrew Breitbart. He understands how they work. Um, so when you've got a conservative out there making the case for conservatism and it's called the dangerous faggot tour, you've got a real problem if you're the left, a real problem, big problem. Um, and that same problem that you would have with somebody like, you know, if, if it turned out that, that uh, Brad Pitt was a conservative, uh, you'd have a real problem because the social proof is, is breaking down. So as far as the um, shutting down the event goes, I've seen the video of that. Those people got up on stage and, you know, really really physically threatened him. I don't think I'd be sitting there flinching like that. If somebody was in my face like that, I suspect one of us is going to jail. I, I, I certainly hope that's the case. I, I don't know. Um, if you think that was terrifying, uh, I got a chance to talk to Ben Shapiro's bodyguard who said that they were in New York and uh, Black Lives Matters people were starting to um, bash down the door. Literally bash down the door and they're talking, Ben Shapiro was speaking there and you could hear from outside, you're hearing kill the Jew, you know, and they're... <laughs> So the security guy goes and opens the door with a gun drawn. He says, I think we all ought to back up now because this is how people get killed. And um, that's not funny um, at all. I'm going to be um, doing some colleges and stuff. I don't think I, I, don't, I don't get that kind of reaction, probably because I'm not quite so provocative, but I have to be prepared for it. And I, on some level, I feel a little, you know, hurt that uh, I haven't gotten that kind of protesting yet. But, um, hey, take care, Foghorn. Uh, but, um, yeah, he's dangerous. He has to be stopped. And so does, you know, Ben Johnson and, and so does Stacey Dash and all the rest of them. They're just, by their presence, destroying their narrative. And they're fantastically um, valuable pieces. And I, I haven't, haven't met him, but I sure would like to. I'd like to shake his hand. He's a really good guy. Two to go. Laura, Laura Wallace says, um, should Ted Cruz accept any Trump administration post? I think he should refuse anything up to and including vice president, but would not mind seeing him leave the Senate to take Justice Scalia's place. Otherwise, I want him fighting and, and leading in the Senate. He's my senator. He has said he's not really interested in being appointed to the Supremes. What do you think? Uh, Ted Cruz uh, was my candidate, obviously. I know Ted rather well. I think Ted Cruz is the only I think he's, well, we can probably get down to two or three anyway, the people that are actually in office in Washington that genuinely get it. Um, so uh, I think he's irreplaceable. I'd love to see Ted Cruz on the Supreme Court. I cannot imagine a better place for him than being on the Supreme Court, with the possible exception of uh, stop before then. If Donald Trump is elected, if it were, well, who knows what Donald Trump's going to do, but if it were me, I would not put Ted Cruz right on the Supreme Court. I would take, um, I'd put Ted Cruz and make him attorney general. Because I want somebody to go in there and clean up this mess. I want somebody to go looking at all these NSA, um, you know, excursions. I want people looking into Benghazi. I want people looking into uh, all of these missile defense deals. I want people looking into the Iranian deal. I want I want somebody in there who's going to bring these people to justice. And I've said before, I don't think you should. I don't think these people should go to jail. I don't think Hillary Clinton should go to jail. I think she should be disgraced for the rest of her life. But I don't want to live in a country where the the next administration puts the previous administration in prison. I think that's kind of a banana republic. I think they ought to prosecute Hillary Clinton. They ought to find her guilty of all these charges. They ought to, they ought to sentence her to um, 20 years in prison or whatever she's due to get. 
And then, I don't think she's pardoned. I think the sentence is suspended. In the interest of comedy, is that comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y, is that the word? In the interest of civility, in the interest of the country, we're not going to put you in jail, though you have been found guilty and you have been sentenced to jail. We're not going to put you in jail. And we're not pardoning you either. We're just not going to enforce this uh, judgment against you. Um, and that's going to take an attorney general. And, and he can be attorney general for a number of years, and then he can go and become a Supreme Court justice after that. I think that'd be great. I think the best thing I can think of for Ted Cruz. And the last one for the night is from Cameron C. Smith. Um, do we really got to love Bernie? I hear this a lot from folks about 18 to 20. I guess because he's an old white guy with an accent, maybe. I'm not really sure. I have an idea of how I would shut this down, but how would you shoot this down? Uh, my next video is going to be called Bernie's Free College Isn't Free, and you have to understand what it is about Bernie that appeals to young people and what it is about Bernie that allows Bernie to get to where he is and why Bernie is such a big believer in all of this nonsense, because he really does believe it. Um, Bernie Sanders is is running one of the oldest scams in the world, and that is the um, the envy scam. He's basically doing the one thing that has destroyed all republics throughout history and turned them into dictatorships because they simply cannot survive this. When you can convince people that they can vote themselves money out of the treasury, which means vote themselves money out of money that's been taken from other people, then it's game over. Um, and Bernie is using people's envy and their and their um, and their jealousy to demonize the people that he's going to try and take stuff from. And then he's also appealing to people's avarice and and um, and resentment. He's basically saying these people have more than you do, and it's not fair. And I am going to go get you your fair share of their stuff. There's a certain kind of person that really finds that extremely appealing and. Um, and I would say most people probably find that appealing. And, and they, they know on some level that just going into somebody's house and taking all their stuff is stealing. So you have to make the case that they got it illegally because then taking their stuff is justice. Otherwise, it's stealing. So Bernie's basically doing what incompetent people have done their entire lives. And lazy people. Bernie Sanders is incompetent and he's lazy. He's never worked a day in his life that wasn't a government job. He was just repeatedly just thrown out of jobs or thrown out of opportunities and stuff because he was just lazy. He took advantage of his wife and took advantage of this money, took advantage of this and that. Bernie is simply lazy. But Bernie wants some of the nice things in life, and Bernie has figured out that the way to do it is to promise some, some people something taken from other people. Works like a charm um, on the short term. It's all the communists were about. It's all the Nazis were about. Let's look at how these guys got started and how Lenin and, and, um, and Trotsky and, and then later Stalin sold this and then how, uh, how Adolf Hitler sold it. It's either the kulaks uh, or the bourgeoisie uh, or the landowners. They've taken more than their fair share. Let's go kill them and take their stuff. Or it's the Jews or it's the one percenters or it's the intelligence, intelligentsia and... Cambodia and China and all the rest of it. Right? You got it. The first thing you have to do is you have to make these people demons because if they're not demons, you can't steal from them and you can't kill them. But once you've made them demons, then you can take their stuff and give it to you. When I talk about um, in the in the firewall that's already a week late, uh, I basically said Bernie's talking about free college, and I'd simply say, what does that mean? What does free college mean? All right, you want to vote for Bernie, and Bernie's going to give you free college. What does it mean? Does it mean that the teachers aren't going to get paid? That they're going to volunteer their time? Does it mean that um, that they're not that the college isn't going to have to pay for water or, uh, or or internet costs? Does it mean if you turn on the lights in a lecture hall that the, the electric company is not going to bill them? Is that what it means? Free college? Because if it doesn't mean that, then free college is a non sequitur. If it doesn't mean that, then it means that it's free to you, but somebody's paying for it. And so the question then becomes, young millennial Bernie supporter. Um, you want this because it's being paid for, but it's not being paid for by you yet. But in the olden days of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you would have to get a loan from either your parents or from a bank. In order to get that loan, you would have to show that you had the ability to pay it off, which means that loans for $250,000 for medieval Renaissance poetry were not being written because banks and parents knew there was no way on earth that this was ever going to be repaid. And so student loans were available to people who showed some degree of aptitude in working and who were going to be in, in positions that 
you know, would pay well. And if it turned out you wanted to be in medieval Renaissance poetry, you might be able to borrow five grand or ten grand. You're not going to borrow 250 grand for that. Once Obama comes in through Obamacare, through the health care law, makes all of this student um, loans guaranteed by the government, what does that do? Well, it's the same thing as with the housing crisis. When housing and mortgages are based on a risk-reward relationship, a bank will put up some of its capital, some of its assets, in order to make more capital if the risk is worth the reward. If these people seem likely to pay it back, then we'll do it. We understand some people who we approve are going to default on the loan, but that's why we have a credit rating. And after, over time, we get a pretty good idea who's going to pay things back and who's not. So it's the same thing with, um, with student loans. It's no longer about whether or not the, st the student can pay the loan back because the federal government can pay any price that, that the universities care to charge. So since the federal government's uh, guaranteeing the loan, the, the, the college is raising their tuitions through the roof, and people are getting themselves $250,000 debts. And then people that are trying to sell them more snake oil, I hear this on the radio on Sirius all the time, it's enough to make me want to take my car off a bridge, honestly. There's an ad out there that says, um, don't, let the, don't let the credit card companies fool you into thinking you have to repay everything. Don't let the credit card companies fool you into thinking that you're responsible to pay this bill. And then they go on about how you can get uh, debt relief or d debt just completely forgiven and stuff. And it's like, that's what they're telling people. Don't let them fool you into thinking that you're responsible for paying back the money you, you signed on the dotted line for. Okay. Sound good to me if I had a big student loan too. By the way, if they make student loans guaranteed and if they forgive all the student loan, if they just forgive it, if they just say, if, if Hillary's elected, and they just say, we're just going to forgive it. You know, all the money that you racked up, it's, it's owed the government. We're just going to say in the interest of the country and, and the American dream, we're just going to forgive it. I think there should be a class action lawsuit from every single person in this country who ever had to pay student loans back. And I'm one of them. And I think we ought to be able to say, hey, listen, I am not going to be a chump here. I paid all this money in because I borrowed it. I'm responsible for it. And if I'm doing the right thing and I'm getting screwed by these guys who are doing the wrong thing and they're getting benefits, no, just sue them. So um, college isn't free. It, it, this is the point I, I just digress as I always do. I said, you know, you, you like college. You Bernie supporters because you think it's free and it's not being paid for you. And it's not being and you're not paying for it yet. Back in the old days, you might take out 10 grand, 15, 20 grand, or 50 grand for a loan. If you're an engineer, you might go to 100 grand, 200 grand. If you're going to be a doctor, you'd pay it back. And it might take you five or 10 years to pay it back. But once you paid it back, it was paid back. You people who think you're going to get your free college are going to be paying. You're going to pay for the free college. Okay? You're going to pay for it. You think the rich are going to pay for it? They're not. The rich, income tax does not affect the rich. The, the rich simply. They've, they've got their wealth is already there. Income tax is just measuring how much is coming in. If they want to, if they're going to put a 97% income tax on things, rich people just won't have any more income anymore. They'll just sit on what they're already got, and they won't spend it on new companies or you know anything like that. They're just going to keep it. So you're not going to take it from the rich. You're going to be paying for it yourself. And what's going to happen is this: um, you are going to get your free college, and then Bernie's going to put this on the national debt tab. And the national debt's going to go from $20 billion, which is double what it was for the previous 43, 44 presidents, and it's going to go to $37 trillion or $40 trillion. And you think that's not a problem because being 20 years old, you think that, well, okay, whatever, you know, if we default, we default. But I'm here to tell you, you cannot make $35,000 billion simply go away and have things be the way they were before it happened. It just, no. As I say in this video, if it turns out that you think that the default is going to be in your favor, if this if this government defaults on that debt, your problem is not going to be finding a job that you know gives you free Uber and, and two hours of social media a day. Your problem is going to be, will I be able to catch enough rats to eat over spits on burning tires out in the street to get me through the evening? That's what your problem is going to be. So you're going to pay for this free college. You're going to pay for this free college every single year of your life. For the rest of your life, you're going to be paying tax rates that are much higher than they would have been otherwise. And every single year, you're going to give up two-thirds or three-quarters of what you make for that free college. And you're going to be paying for that free college every single day for the next 60, 70, 80 years. And furthermore, because of this debt and because of these tax rates, you're not going to get a job because that free college that you got is going to cost you a job every day. Companies are going to be looking at not going to be looking at how many people we can hire this year. They're going to be looking at how many, how few people can we afford to fire and still stay in business? How few people are we going to have to let go? So you're going to be living a life of, 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 of slavery and destitution. Destitution. You're going to be poor. 
You're going to be poor because you're going to want the same thing as everybody else has. And when the government's out of money, everybody's going to get crap. It's what happens everywhere. It's happened in the Soviet Union. It goes everywhere. There is no free college because if it was free, then teachers wouldn't charge and you wouldn't have to pay for the electricity. It's being paid for by somebody else. And the somebody else that's paying for your free college is you. You're paying for it. You idiots are paying for it. All the people that ran up the debt prior to you are going to be dead. And you're going to be paying it off, you know. Each person, American born now, uh, comes into the world with what is it? Each individual person is worth has seventy five thousand dollars worth of debt in order to pay off the national debt. You come into the world with seventy five thousand uh, dollars. Oh man! So that's how you get around them. You know, you just and you have to call out their moral, th the moral lowliness of this. I'm certainly not going to go this again because I hardly give a public speech ever. But I basically, you know, you say, hey, listen, guys, you want wealth redistributed to you but you don't want to redistribute your own wealth because if you did you'd sell your xboxes and your and your phones and you give it to homeless people so you don't get a high horse on this you're stealing from people and you're and you're trying to make other people pay for stuff that you want because it's because you're lazy and because you're and you're um and you're kind of evil and uh and you're raised that way they all have to be virtue signaling. They all have to be social justice warriors. And when you convince them that they're actually just common thieves, uh, then you can start to change some minds. And we'll see. Um, I just wish, you know, uh, a, even some of the most reasonable wishes are unreasonable. Um, I just wish that these progressives would, would give us a state or two where they just leave us alone. Yeah, Oklahoma and uh, Idaho. <laughs> You have no federal taxes, nor do you get any federal assistance. You're on your own. You you get to you don't have to pay a uh, uh, federal income tax, but you don't get any federal benefits. If you want to improve the interstate highway system or the airports, you have to pay for it yourself. I think if they did that, it would be absolutely astonishing. Every single conservative with any kind of brain in his in, would would move to Oklahoma or Idaho or wherever. And that place would become then the powerhouse of the world. They would produce everything that would be of value. They'd have all of the invention would belong there, their capital, their their innovation, everything would come right out of that one little state where they're being left alone. And and uh, even something as um, simple as that seems to be really off the table. That's why I'm glad there's a Texas. And when I say that, it's not just I'm glad that there's one state that's got enough culturally behind it so that it's not buying into this as quickly as everybody else is. I also like the fact that Texas is the only state that was once its own country and is prepared to be again, I think. They don't, Texans are different because unlike every other state in the union, they were their own independent country, fought for their own independence from Mexico, voluntarily surrendered their uh, independence um, and then transferred it to the Confederacy and then transferred it back to the union. But you can always tell it's like, well, we're going to see how this works. Uh, the idea that Texas could just go off and start its own country. People ask me all the time why I don't move to Texas, because I like California, I like the weather. If Texas becomes its own country, I'm there. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm already an honorary citizen of the Republic of Texas, thanks to Ted Cruz, by the way. So I got my cowboy hat and I got my spurs and I'm armed. So I think I'll probably be fitting in there just fine. Um... Anyway, I think that'll do it for the night. This is a little longer than I thought. That's actually a bit longer than I thought. I don't care. Had, uh, hour and 47 minutes? Not too bad. And so, my friends, another epic uh, another epic uh, Stratosphere Lounge comes to an end. I know that the people that are watching this live generally pretty much limited to, um, you know, people who are in medical comas in hospitals and uh, night watchmen who are snoozing through uh, the, uh, the evening out and, you know, Nowheresville. Uh, but for those of you that are here watching, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I feel so bad about having to make this show the bottom of the priority stack, but something has to be. There's just so much editing to do. There's so much things that have to get done. And um, and I'm sorry when I have to miss two in a row. Um, and I'm sorry if I have to miss next week. I, I'm not planning on it, but we are going to get stabilized. We have taken on an enormous amount of new work. And I actually feel for the first time, really, since I've been running this business, uh, I really feel like for the first time ever, um, this membership is worth the money. I want to be clear on this. Uh, the people that had supported us previously, I, I don't feel like I was ripping them off. I was doing everything I possibly could, shoveling as much snow as I could. But I think the people prior to this were doing it to get the message out there, and certainly they were 
generous enough and big hearted enough and, and kind enough to not hold me to the membership deliverables. But things are different now. If you go look at BillWhittle.com, you're going to see members only content posted almost every day. Um, and uh, I'm really actually starting to feel like um, like it's worth it. Certainly, as I said at the beginning of the show, my attitude towards the work is completely different. It's just 100% different. Uh, I am um, I'm so happy to be working with Scott and Steve, and we have assistant editors. And, and now I have the problem that many of you business owners have. It's not just a question of feeding me anymore. Previously, it was feeding me and feeding Carla. Now there's five or six people, pretty much all of them part-time, but, you know, they're counting on me. And I'm counting on you, and uh, you're counting on somebody else. And so if you're one of those people that have become a member recently, I cannot thank you enough. If you're one of those people who have been here since the beginning, then I cannot thank you enough more. And with that, I think we will probably close out uh, episode 120 of the Stratosphere Lounge. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll send the secret Dakota rings and all the rest of the stuff that you guys need. And uh, until then, keep eating that uh, Alpo and, um, and brushing with... Um, you know, uh, preparation nature, whatever the whatever the sponsors are for this week, I've lost completely lost track. Getting a little loopy now. I got a lot of work to do before I go home. So uh, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time. <laughs>